So good, so good. We have to give the coronavirus love right there. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for watching online. We do have some of our staff and family that are here and wanted to just uh, let you know that we are grateful to have this opportunity to share through visual and virtual, uh, you know, reality. And as a ministry, this is something that we've been practicing for many, many years. And, uh, and so we're grateful to have this vehicle to bring the gospel and bring the word to you. And I was thinking about this today because some of you have made uh, comments on Facebook or, or asked questions. And I, I know I even read a few that were sort of like, upset that we weren't opening the doors. Um, you know, in a conversation with the governor and many faith leaders and also listening to health officials, uh, they have asked us very strongly to resist gatherings of 250 or more, which is all of our services, all four on the weekends with all the children and everybody that's in the facility. Uh, we would be jeopardizing many of those in our ministry who have immune compromised uh, uh, sicknesses, who are elderly, and who are just uh, right now not able to fight off this coronavirus. And I thought about this, and I wanted to read it from Scripture in Philippians chapter 2. Be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your hearts, but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of our own interests. And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. Probably never in the history of this ministry and never really in our lifetime, and I'm speaking for everyone watching, have we ever faced a global travesty like this. The potential of the coronavirus spreading throughout the world went from being a potential problem a week ago to an actual pandemic. Now, I want to just remove the doubt that we are doing this because of fear. <laughs> We're not afraid. Matter of fact, many of our staff and volunteers are here right now and they will be working literally around the clock. They've been working. We have the greatest staff in the world, really do. And I don't say that in competition with other ministries. I say that because it's a fact. I've never worked with greater people, been around greater families. And that goes doubly for our volunteers. And they are here because they love you. They love this ministry. They believe in the gospel and they believe in the mission of Grace Church and the purposes of God. And they're going to be here for you. It's just going to be a little different for a while. In talking with the healthcare professionals and, like I said, those in local and state government as well as national government, we are going to adhere to this. It's not fear. I, I read one guy's comment, and I, if you're watching, please, I'm not upset with you, but it was, man, I'm going to have to find a church that's not afraid and is going to meet. I think that's irresponsible. Because if we do this ourselves, if we kind of resist the gatherings for a few weeks, I believe this with all my heart, that within a couple of weeks we're going to see this slow up greatly. And probably by Easter, this is just a prediction from me, no one else, uh, hopefully, and maybe I'm just being very po positive, I believe by Easter we'll have a great four services or five services that weekend and celebrate not only the resurrection of Jesus, but in many respects of the resurrection of families whose children just went on a 24-day weekend and uh, many of which are going to be tied up in their homes uh, who can't work, who are either going to work remotely like many of us will. And uh, that's going to be good I, I encourage you to be with your family right now and enjoy this. And, and let me just, let me stop and pause before I share a few more things that are very, very important. Uh, first and foremost, take time with your family, but when the service time that you originally or normally go to is happening, put aside distractions. Gather together as a family. Some of you have family in the house that don't normally go to church. It's a great chance to bring them into the living room and say, hey, can we just spend the next hour worshiping the Lord and really growing and learning uh, from, from the word? 
And uh, we want to spread this message around to as many places as we can. So please share these services on your Facebook. Reach out to us through Facebook. I'm completely violating the policies of the ministry because this is a special time that requires special steps. And so you can reach out through Facebook. You can reach out through email. You can reach out in a, a variety of different ways. And we will be working around the clock for you. Also, if you're a pastor or you're in a ministry that doesn't have this ability, we helped about 14 churches this week. I spoke to about 13 of them myself personally that have no online presence, have never done Facebook Live. And man, they're all literally closing their doors and trying to figure this out. We will help you. Okay, we'll do all we can to at least teach and educate and encourage. Okay? And on top of all of that, I think it's important to note that our teen ministry, our pastor of family ministry and student ministry, Brooklyn, and her team have provided uh, a kid's experience online. So you all you need is a secondary mobile device or computer, and they can go on, click the Kids Extreme, and they can be experiencing that uh, journey uh, during the same time you're watching services. So I want to encourage you to have your children tune in and be a part of our online experience, as well as the fact that Tuesday nights we will have youth ministry through virtual ministry. And so you'll be able to tune in to uh, our website or Facebook Live and experience that. Many of our other ministries will take a hiatus for a short time, but we're going to encourage virtual small groups. We're going to encourage virtual gatherings. There's also something else. As a ministry, we cannot sit back and do nothing and, 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 and really hide out. This is a community in need. And right next door at Walmart, they're going to start testing for the coronavirus. I think it would be great for us if we could pool some resources, if all of us would just give up a few resources. You know, uh, somebody said to me, why, why all the toilet paper shortage? I mean, this isn't even a lower GI uh, problem. I said, oh, I, I figured that out. Um, you know, the reason people are buying so much toilet paper is because when one person sneezes, the 10 people around them poop their pants. Listen, we can't, we can't live in fear like that, okay? I, that, that was just the best guess of your pastor. Uh, but here's, here's the reality. Can't live in fear like that. You got to be sure that as a ministry, we continue to have the resources, the finances, and the manpower to create kits that can help people during this time. So we're going to do that. Uh, be listening for Wes Porter, your pastor of small groups, and Susie Glannon, pastor of missions, and they will be reaching out to the small groups who are our first responders, and we'll create care packets, maybe some toilet paper uh, for people that need formula for children, diapers, some of the uh, uh, basic essentials in medicine. We'll have that, and we'll get it out to as many people in need, both connected to our ministry and in our community. The church has to be the bright light in the midst of this kind of travesty and, and tragedy. Uh, on top of that, I also wanted to share this. We're going to be working in shifts at the church. We're not going to gather together in our uh, staff meetings as normal. We'll probably do some stuff virtually uh, and through online presence. But overall, we will be manning the, the phones. We have about eight of our staff who will be overseeing the Facebook messages and uh, administrators that are able to get back to you. So if you message us through Facebook, through the gracechurchco.com website or YouTube channel, uh, if you watch us on YouTube and then you reach out to us through our, our website, we will get back to you, okay? Now, all of that announcement and uh, insight to say this. About two and a half months ago, I was preparing this sermon series called Beneath the Surface. And over the next four weeks, we're going to answer some of the most difficult passages and beliefs, if you will, theologies in the Bible. And one of those is really, I think, ironic, not to God, but to us, that it was the very first message I would kick off this series with, which is, more than meets the eye. As a matter of fact, my opening illustration I'll share with you now was that uh, a famous scientist, microbiologist named Louis Pasteur, uh, many years ago, over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, uh, was one who discovered something that many scientists denied. As a matter of fact, they believed in spontaneous generation that 
that basically maggots just appeared on, on you know, bloody meat or they appeared just out of nowhere, basically, and that disease kind of came about that way. And then Louis Pasteur discovered this, that actually we have microorganisms and we have microbiology that we can't see that creates these types of pandemics that we're facing right now. The viruses, I mean, he was, I believe, instrumental in the polio vaccine. So ironic that I was talking about that, writing that a few months ago before I ever really gave coronavirus a thought. And now here we are. Here we are being impacted. If you're not going to be directly impacted, which I'm going to say there's a very low chance you're going to be directly impacted, you will be and have been indirectly impacted. We have. As a family, we've been hit hard. And I, I don't really want to share anything with you, but I will just tell you that it, it, it can cause the collapse of, uh, of businesses and, um, you know, people's finances in a very short time. And we need to be here for each other. As a ministry, we have to trust that God is in control. And you know what? For the first time, I can actually say that all over the world, everybody is facing the same thing. Think about it. It's the first time in our history we can actually say everyone in the world is going through this in some way, shape, or form. Borders are closing. Air travel. The, the airlines will lose $191 billion this month. That's just one industry. We've already seen what's happened with the stock market. We see a lot that's going on. And here's what we're being reminded of. We're not in control of anything. Never have been. That's a misunderstanding. God is in control. And it only takes a simple virus, yes, tragic for some, but a simple virus that most people will recover from to bring us to our knees. And I believe that God doesn't want to see this. He doesn't want people destroyed or, or, or death to hit families. He doesn't love death. That's why he brings life through Jesus Christ. However, he allows it. And he allows that impact so that we will turn and say, wait a second, God, I was doing all this on my own and I need you. And for many of you, that'll be the first time that you understand that when I share at the end of this message. You know, spiritual warfare is real. And if God was to open our eyes right now to that virus, we'd really be afraid. But at least we'd be able to avoid it, right? There it is in the air. There it is on the desk. But if God opened your eyes to the spiritual war that's happening between demons and angels right now, you'd die. So would I, out of fear. We'd just fall over. Our heart would stop beating. There is a spiritual war. As a matter of fact, the Bible discusses that, but I want to look at it from an angle of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being tempted in the wilderness. And I want to show you how temptation is the greatest enemy that we face, really, that Satan uses. It's his scheme. It's his plan. And it comes in virtually any package you can imagine. And how do we withstand it? First of all, uh, when you talk about what you can't see, uh, we don't have to look any further than the coronavirus from a physical standpoint, but what about spiritual? Well, the Bible tells us this, that Satan does his best work when we are at our weakest moments or our greatest victories or after our greatest victories. So I will, I will just bet that most of us are more susceptible to Satan's attacks after our greatest victory than our biggest defeat. Because a lot of times, and we have seen many things that have shook this nation to the core over the years, and people often turn to God, they turn to the church. This is the first time in the history of literally this country that people can't turn directly to a church service. They can't come into a church service and, and, and be comforted and be guided. They can't sit down with a pastor or sit down with a ministry leader because of this pandemic. First time ever. When 9-11 hit, we ministered to thousands of people in a week who had never stepped foot in this church. When, when tragedies like the war that raged and ravaged and still is going in many respects uh, happened, people turned to the church when the stock market collapsed in 08, and when the stock market uh, went through other times where the economy dipped and we had all kinds of things that have happened, people turned to the church. Right now, you're watching. And so we want to ask you to make sure you're sharing this with everybody because it's the only way that we can care for them spiritually in this moment. 
But when Jesus was tempted, we see in Matthew chapter 4, and I want to just look at Satan's temptations real quick. Take a look at these. Your notes are there on your app, or you can go to the website and download. You can fill them out right there. But listen to this. Jesus ate nothing for 40 days and nights. After this, he was very hungry. I can imagine. I can't go about four hours without eating. But it says, the devil came to Jesus to tempt him. The devil said, if you are the son of God, tell these rocks to become bread. You know, here's, here's reality. Satan finds those areas in our lives where we are most vulnerable. And in this case, Jesus, who is the son of God, who was not capable of sinning, but was capable of being tempted in every way, was starving. And so Satan looks at this weakness and he says, listen, we can, we can turn, you can turn stones into bread. People have often asked me, why was Jesus tempted? If you look at it, it came after the beginning of his ministry, his baptism. Why was he tempted? To show us how to face temptation, to show us how to overcome the attacks of the enemy. Here's reality. 40 days, Jesus was tempted. We are now facing a pandemic that could possibly keep us home, away from our normal routines for 40 days. So let's look at this not as a, a, a tragedy, though it has been in many people's lives, and let's look at it as a test where we can grow closer to the Lord in this time. You know, some of you need to slow down. I'm one of you. And we need to spend more time at home with our families. I just flew my youngest son in from Los Angeles. We get some time with him that was unexpected. And he has zero breaks in his college schedule. I mean, he doesn't come home. And so we've had that opportunity that was afforded to us. Take advantage of it, okay? Make the best of these bad situations. You know what Satan's desire is? Satan's desire is twofold. If you're a lost person that doesn't know Jesus as your savior, he wants to drag you to hell. And if you're a Christian, he wants you to become apathetic. Guys, if we become apathetic, we don't care about what's happening or we become selfish, we're, doing exact, we're playing into the hands of the enemy. Look at this in Matthew 4 again. Then the devil led Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem. He put Jesus on a very high place of the temple. The devil said, if you are the son of God, jump off. It is written in the scriptures. He has put his angels in charge of you. They will catch you with their hands and you will not hit your foot on a rock. It's a very interesting way that Satan twisted scripture. You know, a lot of churches, preachers, they actually do that. You know, false belief systems, uh, cults, they take scripture and they'll, they'll pull a verse out of context and they'll make it say what they want. That individual that said, man, we're Christians, we can't get sick. Excuse me? We're Christians, we can't, nothing can come against us. Um, every single person, believer or not, unless Jesus comes back in their lifetime, is going to die. Where you spend eternity after you die is what matters. That's, a, that's an irresponsible way to even look at prayer. Listen, we're susceptible because we're human. We're wrapped in a body of flesh. We live in a broken world and a broken planet. And yes, we are overcomers ultimately because our home isn't here. That's why we're overcomers. Our home's in heaven. So we need to keep our eyes on reality. Satan twists scripture and he does it a lot. You know what else he does? Satan's master plan is comfort. He keeps us busy, wealthy, powerful, and famous. Those are his big schemes. And many of you are like, well, I'm not wealthy and I'm not powerful and really not famous. I bet you're busy. And you know what busyness is? Busy is this, being under Satan's yoke. You know what a yoke is? It was used to, to fasten, still is in many countries, two animals to harness them together so their power could be used. In this case, it's being fastened to Satan's plan and being ineffective for the purposes of God. Matthew 4 says, and the devil led Jesus to the top of a very high mountain. He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and all the great things that are in those kingdoms. And the devil said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these things. Isn't that interesting? 
I mean, Satan had the ability, or at least he was convinced he had the ability, to give Jesus the kingdoms of the world. Why? Because, again, this is in our home. But Jesus is sitting there most likely thinking, uh, Satan, I created everything. I don't need you. And we know as we look further that, that Jesus had the responses for these uh, temptations. But I, I want to tell you what they were wrapped up in. Jesus taught us something in his responses. Man won't live by bread alone. Don't tempt the Lord thy God. Here's what Satan te- or what Jesus teaches us about Satan's temptations. First of all, you got to expect them. Expect them to come. They will come relentlessly while we're here on this earth. And many of us go, man, I don't want to be tempted. Man, if I'm tempted, then, then I'm in sin. Guys, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to temptation. I want to, ch- I want to help us change our thinking, especially during this crisis. Okay, Here's a way that we can change our thinking about temptation. So many of us go, temptation is, is horrible. It's awful. How about this? Temptation is actually an opportunity to do the right thing. Now, that doesn't mean if you're an alcoholic, you go, I'm going to go to the bar every night and I'm going to do the right thing. No, that's foolish. If you have an addiction or or something, yes, you obviously stay away from the temptation. But will it come? Most likely. Will those temptations be there on this planet? Absolutely. So when it happens, you have an opportunity to say, you know what? I don't need it because Jesus has got me because he's helped me overcome. Because I've got people in my life that are praying for me and supporting me. I've got Celebrate Recovery. And even during this time of, of kind of hiatus, we're going to figure out a way to care for our people through Celebrate Recovery. And you've got to stay strong. You know what? All those things that you've been praying about and all those lessons you've been learning, now's the chance to put them into practice. So first expect them, then reflect on them. Be fully aware of what they are. So many of us see a temptation, we expect it, but we never stop for a moment to see it for what it is, technically. It's a temptation. Okay, that's why this came my way. I get it. So often, this is what I hear from Christians. Why did God let that happen? Why did God do that? Why is God bringing this pandemic? Man, that's the wrong question. I, I can answer it for you. It's a broken planet, broken by original sin. Uh, we, we have an enemy that wants to destroy us. God is our only hope in these times. But when this happens, we need to reverse our thinking from why did God allow this to what do you want me to learn from this, God? What are you trying to teach me, God? So reflect on them and then reject them. Sometimes we roll up our sleeves and say, come on, devil, bring it. But instead, we probably should get on our knees rather than roll up our sleeves and say, Lord, give me the strength to reject this. All right. So Jesus demonstrates that. And I think many of us fail to understand that there's a there's a verse in Scripture. Maybe you've read it or heard it. I want to break it down for a minute because temptation oftentimes starts within us. It's not actually outside of of our minds and our bodies. First John chapter two, verse 16 says this, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. If you go back in that verse, circle the three uh, really uh, things that you see that, that bring temptation. A craving for physical pleasure, a craving for what I see and pride in my achievements and possessions. Now, that means it all starts with a desire, my deepest, darkest desires. Some desires can be good. I mean, think about God gave sexual desire to us. It's a gift. It's a beautiful gift within the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman, fully committed to Christ, God says, sex is amazing, but it becomes a deep, dark secret when we entertain pornography and we entertain relationships that are sexual outside of marriage, outside of God's plan, outside of monogamy. So it starts with a desire. I've often said this. I love the quote. A thought becomes a desire. A desire becomes an action. An action becomes a habit. And a habit becomes a way of life. It starts 
with your deepest, darkest desire. He says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. Second, it all continues with what I allow myself to look at consistently. You think back to the, uh, one of the greatest kings and the man that God called a man after his own heart, King David. You talk about a craving for everything we see in this passage. King David looked out from his rooftop, and the first time I truly believe he was innocent, and he saw Bathsheba. I don't know if she was innocent. Maybe she knew he could, the king could see her, but he looked out, and he saw her bathing on her rooftop. Now, it was different back then, guys. They, you know, they didn't have indoor plumbing. It was a different world, so don't start questioning, you know, that they built a tub on the top of their castle, and he looks down. He sees Bathsheba bathing. The sin wasn't accidentally seeing a beautiful woman taking a bath. The sin was he looked again, and he looked again, and he kept looking. And that look became a desire that drove him to adultery, murder, when he couldn't get Uriah to actually sin, or I mean actually have sex with his wife, and then the death of a child. You see, God's plan is what Satan continues to mess up. And that's why temptation is the desire, the, the visual uh, want. That's why pornography is devastating our culture, devastating it. I mean, this statistic is mind-blowing, and it's scary because it's men who actually admit it. So 92% of all Christian men in leadership admit to have looked at pornography in the last 30 days. Why? Because it's on our mobile device, it's on our computer, it's on our laptops, our iPads, whatever. And it's just the click of a button. The thought becomes a desire, desire becomes an action, action becomes a habit, and habit becomes a way of life. And then finally, it all ends with what I determine to live for. What are you determining to live for? 1 John 2, 16, and pride in our achievements and possessions. Okay, let's just... Let's just have a real heart to heart talk right now. Right now, everything you think you have, everything you've counted on, your job, your income, the global economy is teetering. It's teetering. It could actually end in catastrophe. Now, I. I'm not a prophet of doom, but there will be a day when that happens. There will be a day when a pandemic wipes out a quarter of the world's population. The Bible tells us about it. There will be a time when wars and pestilence and famine and disease destroy three quarters of the world's population during the tribulation. Now, I don't believe we're there. I, don't, I think this is a bleep on the screen. It's a, it's a minor contraction. But that day will come. What if right now, everything you've ever owned, everything you've ever known was gone? Because you're not watching a movie right now. You're living that nightmare. You see, we're all connected through the global economy. We're all connected in many ways to people that believe completely different than us. I mean, China threatened the other day to shut off all prescriptions. Do you know what that would mean? That would mean the catastrophic deaths of 50 million people with heart disease and cancer. And I mean, it's frightening. And we have what, as a country, put ourselves at the mercy of a communist country that needs Jesus, doesn't need to own our prescriptions. Why am I saying this? Because guys, putting your faith in money and possessions and fame is a waste of time. Put your focus on the purposes of God. If ever before you were going to commit to live your life, Christian, for Jesus, that time's now. Because there are going to be neighbors in your community and, and friends that are around the corner going, what is happening? And how do I navigate this? And we have the answer. We have the ability to share Christ with them. Can you say Christ died for your sins? You can share the gospel. 
Can you say for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life? You can share the gospel. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be evangelist. You can do it. And guess what? Now you may be actually the only evangelist preacher they ever hear. Another way you can do it, you can share these services. As soon as we're done, go and share it because they're going to hear the gospel. We're also going to give you a way that you can access our gospel, a two-minute presentation, a three-minute presentation of the gospel so that you can get it out there. Guys, two years ago, we shared the gospel with 2.4 million people in a year. Let's do it again. I bet you more than 2.4 million people would watch this gospel presentation now because they're scared. We're not retreating. So how do we withstand the enemy? When these things happen, how do we withstand the world, the flesh, and the devil? I want to give you three promises and practices, and then we'll, we'll close up with a song that we need to hear. We need to sing. First thing, put on God's amazing armor. Now, we hear that and we say, well, wait a second, preacher, what are you talking about? What's his armor? Well, he describes it. In Ephesians, there are other places throughout Scripture, but just listen to this description of the armor of God. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for last. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious, circle that, with the force of this explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides. Circle that. So you're protected as you confront the slave driver or the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. You need to read that every day. You are more than a conqueror, Christian. You will rise victorious. We are not retreating. We are not afraid. I'm not scared of a pandemic, and you shouldn't be either, because God is saying, I'm in control. I'm still on the throne, and you are more than conquerors. But he doesn't say, just be foolish. Just walk out the door and do whatever you want and don't care about what other people are saying and don't care about other people. That's the exact opposite. He says, be wise. Put on the armor of God. There's six pieces. The belt of truth. You know, where's truth come from? From God. And where does God speak the truth? His word. He tells us that it's the shoes of the gospel. Isn't it ironic that the one piece of armor that goes on our feet is the gospel? It's the only purpose, Christians, that we only get to live out on, on earth. All the other purposes, glorifying God, uh, building relationships, acting like Jesus, caring for each other, that's going to happen for all eternity. But the gospel is over when we die and when we get to heaven. When people die, they're either in heaven or hell for eternity based on what they do with Jesus. That's why it's the shoes of the gospel. So you've got a chance to go out and share your faith in your community, even if it's through virtual sharing. Email, text message, people are going to ask, even if it's with a six-foot barrier. That's okay. And we are going to provide a video. You can just show them. You can just show them, spread it around. People want an answer. The answer is God. You know what else he says? The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Why? Because righteousness protects the heart. When I do the right thing, I don't live with guilt. I don't live with fear. I don't live with that constant nagging that I shouldn't have done that. And then he goes on to tell us this, a shield of faith. You know, that's something, that's a piece of equipment that the ancient soldier had to literally take up and hold like this. And he could move it. They could protect all of their body with it. Sometimes they had one that was a link to their body. You know what that's determined by? If you have no faith and you haven't been serving God, your shield's that big. But if you're, if you're committed, 
If you allow us to help you through small groups, through ministry, through reading the word and praying, and we're going to be here for you in every avenue possible, your shield's going to grow. And you're going to be able to withstand the attacks of the enemy. He says also the helmet of salvation. You know what that is? We are saved by faith. And faith is an intellectual assent. It is an intellectual decision. That, that terrible phrase that even some of the greatest people who I love, like Billy Graham, people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You don't believe with your heart. You believe with your mind. You're transformed in your life by the Holy Spirit. But the helmet of salvation is about knowing what I believe and knowing the gospel. And then finally, the spirit of the sword. What is that? I fight through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you become a believer today, you have the power of God in your life. You can resist anything that comes your way. Because the Holy Spirit is the power source that spoke the universe into existence. Chew on that one for a little while. So put on the armor. Second, pray through God's awesome spirit. And when I say awesome, I don't mean like, oh, that was an awesome game. I mean awesome. I'm in awe of God. I, 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 I'm, I'm literally on my knees. I was last night. I was praying for some of my family. I was praying for this church. And literally just for a moment, about 1230 in the morning, some of my daughter and niece had left. And I was just like, God, so much potential for good. Instead of thinking about what could happen tragically, what will happen triumphantly? The enemy comes at you. So what does 1 Peter 5 say? He says, if you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hands. Pour out all your worries and stress upon him. I'm going to stop there just brief for a moment. It's okay to be scared. It's absolutely okay. And some of you, you have every right to withdraw from all contact with people. Totally okay. We don't look down on you. We, we, we cherish you. That's why we're doing these services in a virtual way. We're caring for about a quarter to half of our congregation this way. And I know that everybody cares about you and they love you. Don't feel bad about that. Now, don't live in fear. Don't stay afraid. Listen to these words from God, not me, and pour out your worries on the Lord. Your stress, pour it out on him and leave them there. This is critical. You got to circle it, memorize it, leave them there. You know what causes more stress? Stress. I know I'm super smart, okay? Stress causes stress. If I think about stress, I get more stressed. I'm a simple person. I'm not super smart. And so for me, that just works. Okay, right now, I'm having chest pains. The worst thing I can start doing is, maybe I'm having a heart attack on my left arm. Before long, you've created a problem that didn't even exist. Happened to me in 2001. Had a neck injury. Was getting ready to take 20 people to the Amazon, and 14 of them were teenagers. And a parent said to me, you're taking two of my sons, my most precious belongings, only you, Pastor Rick. I wouldn't send them with anybody else. Bring them home safe and healthy. Like, I'm not God. I'll do my best. And I end up in the hospital going, I'm having a heart attack. Doctor's like, you're not having a heart attack. You have an injury and you have anxiety. Seven hours of, tr of, of uh, testing. That's what stress will do, okay? Leave them there. And he says, for he always tenderly cares for you. God cares for you. He loves you. Nothing's going to happen to you that doesn't pass through God's hands. And Christian, if, if, and I hope to God this doesn't happen, but if he calls you home, you're going home. You can't lose. And then he says, be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly like a roaring lion looking for his prey to devour. Now, you ever been to the zoo? Go to the lion cage. It's super beautiful and extremely boring. They just lay there, literally 20 hours a day. Now, I've been there one time when they fed them, and it was awesome. But apart from that, they don't do much, okay? I'm just going to say something going to completely wreck any uh, credibility I have, but my wife and I love a show called Naked and Afraid. 
they're really not naked, it should be blurry and afraid. But anyways, and I love it because they go out in the jungles and in the Serengeti in these places, and they have to exist for 27 days with nothing. And I'm watching one time, this guy's in Africa, he's trying to survive, he ha they always have a camera, they got to document everything, he builds his like stick house, it was nothing, and in the middle of the night, he hears a lion roaring, and he picks up the camera, he's like, the lion is really close, turns the camera, I mean that lion is like on the other side of his little bamboo village. And he picks up his camera and he's like, I got to get out of here. And he starts to slowly walk out the front door. And when he flashes a light, there's like 10 lionesses waiting to devour, which should tell you something. But anyways, he looks out there and he, he goes, man, I'm glad I didn't run. And he went back in the village or in his little hut and he waited and they left. Here's a lesson. Satan roars and we run. And when we run, we get into trouble. You know why the armor of God has no back armor? Because you can't retreat. Otherwise, God's not working in your life. So he says, when the lion roars, hey, look to the real lion of Judah. He's already been victorious. You're victorious in him. So pray and pray through the spirit of God and trust him. Someone said to me the other day, well, we're going to have to change our 2020 goals, you know, raising 4.2 million, helping out multiple families, uh, seeing 500 people baptized, 1,600 people come to Christ, 100 and some in the youth ministry, blah, blah, blah. I said, we're not changing anything. If anything, we should, we should increase because God is bringing a testing and he's saying, are you going to trust me? And we're going to reach this goal. We're going to make it in all accounts and beyond. Because in these times is when I know you, church. I know you for 31 years. Thursday was our 31st wedding anniversary. Started this church 31 years ago, March 12th, with my wife, members of my family that are all still here, my friend Greg Steer. We launched this church. And God has brought us through thick and thin. And he will do it again and again and again because we've been committed to the gospel and his purposes. And he said, happy anniversary. Here's a pandemic. And you know what we're doing with it? Ministry. Nothing is changing. It's just virtual. And finally, praise God for the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise him now. Start thanking him now. Worship him now. In a moment, we're going to sing one of the most important songs we've ever sung. And when Jason and Esther and the whole team lead you, worship God and praise him already. You say, but wait, it's still spreading. Praise him. But, but people could die. Praise him. But, but they say the worst is yet to come. Praise him. Because that's when he does miracles. In Acts chapter 16, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, I used to sing a song called I Will Praise the Lord. One of my favorite songs. And the song was about Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi. And it says this, Paul and Silas, undaunted, prayed in the middle of the night and sang songs of praise to God. Stop, er, they were in jail. And it wasn't the Club Med of America, it was jail, prison, nasty environment, facing execution. And they sang songs of praise while the other prisoners listened to their worship. Suddenly, a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. All at once, every prison door flung open and the chains of all the prisoners came loose. And you know what they did? They walked out and stayed because they didn't want the jailer to die. They wanted him to know Jesus. But, but here's the point. When we praise God, he makes miracles happen. If we praise God right now, we could walk out of this building and the virus could disappear. I'm not crazy. I'm serious. We praise God. We could walk out and our elderly relative or friend that we know that has this virus and is fighting for their life could be completely healed. If God chooses, he could shake the foundations of this community and every disease and everything that, that causes us problems could be gone. That is the God we serve. It's not the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament. It's the God of today, yesterday, and forever. And we are triumphant through him. We are victorious through him. If you have never come to the place in your life where you can honestly sit there and think, 
I'm victorious. Nothing can defeat me. Listen to these words in 1 Corinthians 15. But we thank God for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So now, beloved ones, stand firm and secure. Live your lives with an unshakable confidence. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord. Because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. We are more than conquerors. We've already won the battle because Jesus won the war 2,000 years ago on the cross. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. No disease, no famine, no financial crisis, no evil can overcome those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Is he in you? You say, I want to be that conqueror. I want to live with that kind of fearlessness. How do I do it? It begins by surrender. It begins by coming to that place in your mind where you surrender everything you thought you had to do to the reality of what Jesus did. You say, I'm a sinner. I admit it. I admit there's nothing I can do to take away my sins. And right now, I believe Jesus Christ died for me. And I receive the free gift of salvation. The moment you do that, and, and by the way, not I believe and I'm going to try harder. And I believe and I'll, I'll stop sinning. And I believe and I'll go to church every week from now on. No, I believe in Jesus and I receive salvation. Then you get to live a victorious life of gratitude. Saying, thank you, Lord for saving me. That's why we do what we do. That's why we'll be here every day for you. That's why we'll be here every night for you. Because we're going to get through this. We're going to be fine. And there will be some tragedies that we will have to help others navigate. But through Jesus, we will rise above. I've never lied to you. I have not been the perfect preacher. I have not done everything right but I've never lied to you. And I'm telling you, we're going to be fine. And right now, I'm going to pray. And if for the first time, you're putting your trust in Jesus, I want to ask you to pray this prayer and then text the word believe on your phone right away to 313131. And then follow the prompts because we want to help you grow. Pastor Scott will still call this week. We'll get right back in touch. We want to help you grow. We still have gifts for you. We'll, we'll fumigate them, okay? But we still want to help you grow. And then if you're a guest and you're watching for the first time, maybe someone on your Facebook Live shared this, um, thank you, first of all. We love you. Join our E family and come see us when this is over. I believe it's going to be Easter Sunday, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of this mess. And it's going to be an amazing time. That's just my prediction. I don't know. I could be wrong. Hopefully it's sooner, but we're going to do it. And, and if you're a guest, just text guest to 313131. And we will call you and we'll help you grow and we'll make you a, a cared for, loved believer in this ministry. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for salvation that comes through faith in Jesus. And thank you for the free gift. Lord, thank you for these that I believe in faith have come to know you, maybe around the world. God, we're part of your global family that spans time and space, and we are beyond grateful for all that you've done for us today. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Jason and Esther are going to lead us in what I consider probably the most important worship song for right now, because we are overcomers. And then don't turn it off after the song. I have one more thing to share with you. Very important for us to continue doing all of what we need to do. I'm asking all of you who are not hurting through this crisis, who, who are not struggling financially, to dig very deep because this is a city on a hill and we have a lot of people that are going to be hurting and we want to funnel our resources to them. Let's worship God. He's an overcomer. I'll share one more thing. I love you. Yeah.
darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond all creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God we will not be Hello, E! Family, our extended Grace family. We are so grateful that you are watching from around the world. Thank you for joining us for today's services. As a pastor, it's my deep desire that every person who watches our services becomes part of our extended family. Thanks to technology, we're able to extend everything to you that you could receive if you were here in our services, except for one thing, fellowship. One way to resolve this problem could be to start a small group of people who are watching the Grace Church services and then join together during the week for a small group. Discussions can be had around the message. You can have food and fellowship and a lot of fun. As today's message made it very clear, we are in a spiritual battle. And the best example of that is this pandemic. We can't see it, but we're all facing it. However, the bigger enemy has been defeated by Jesus Christ on the cross, the Satan and hell destroyed. The lesser enemy is the pandemic, and it'll be defeated through the grace and mercy and perfect timing of our God. Don't lose heart and don't lose hope. Do battle on your knees in prayer and know that you have a ministry standing with you right here, right now. We're participating today 
in this very moment as a church in our act of financial worship. Grace Church is a global ministry, and in order for us to continue making our services available and reaching out to our 52 or through our 52 local and global ministries, caring for our 51 staff, we covet your financial support. You can give financially through our mobile app or our website, and I want to thank you in advance. May God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you or being seen by you next week. Stay safe and healthy, and take time to just drop us a line. If you'll put in a comment where you're from and who you are, we'll get back to you. We'd love to know who you are and who we're praying for. God bless.